I want you to be aware of its change. Uh, I got back on Friday and uh, I have changed what I'm doing by Sunday. Uh, she is going to be reading to you. If you'll turn to your reflective readings, she will be reading the passage from uh, chapter Luke 19. She's going to be reading 23 through 26. And you see that printed there at the bottom. And then on the other side, the second reading will come from Isaiah, and it's in the middle of your scripture reading on the other side. He will bring us to the Why then did you not put my money into a, the bank? Then when I returned, I could have collected it with interest. He said to the bystanders, take the pound from him and give it to the one who has ten pounds. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten pounds. I tell you, to all those who have, more will be given. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. And from Isaiah, the Lord has given me the tongue of a teacher that I may know how to sustain the weary with the word. Morning by morning he wakens. Quicken my ear to listen to those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheek to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint. Let them con confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me, who will declare me guilty. All of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite you to join me in the responsive Palm Sunday prayer. May we remain here to whisper our hosannas throughout this week. When the world goes silent on the cause of God, may we remain crying out the beat, the hosanna beat that marks the rhythm of this week. In the sound of the breaking bread, hear the broken hosanna. Still we believe in love's way. On the sound of coins being counted, hear the betrayed hosanna. Still we trust in love's choice. In the twisting of the crown of thorns, hear the tortured Hosanna. Still we believe in love's way. In the sound of the lashes, all 39, hear the scourge Hosanna. Still we trust in love's choice. In the sound of nails being hammered, hear the crucified Hosanna. Still we believe in love's way. In the sound of silence, hear the empty Hosanna. Still we trust in love's choice. May we remain here to whisper our Hosannas throughout this week. In every moment, may we remain with you, O Jesus. Still believing, still calling, still your companion. Let the stones remain silent. Give us the courage to remain. The courage not only to whisper, but the courage to shout Hosanna prayers, not just with our lips, but with our lives. Make us able, Lord, to follow you. Well, it is good to be here. I bring you greetings from Illinois and from Iowa and from Nebraska. For the last 27 days, I have been traveling, visiting churches, and sharing the story of the ministry 
here in Willow, Alaska. And it was a wonderful trip, very tiring. Uh, I was emotionally exhausted at the end, not so much physically <coughs> exhausted. I am an introvert, even though I don't act like it. <laughs> it takes a lot of energy for me to be among strangers for 27 days. And uh, I, was, I was tired at the end. I visited 26 churches, uh, met with 800 people, and we have now five new uh, partner churches. Uh, and uh, we, uh, I, I stayed with the Gandhis, <laughs> and they are, uh, they miss us, folks. <laughs> if, if they could figure out a way to physically be here, they would be here, and they would not have moved. But they made the right decision. But boy, do they wish they hadn't made that decision. Um, Rita and uh, Daryl will be back in June, and they will be with us for a month then, and so you'll be able to greet them in person. But they send their greetings. The only regret I had uh, on the trip, really, was that I had to drive in and out of Chicago some five days of my 27. And I don't know where they get their licenses. I would pull every one of them. <laughs> and uh, I just uh, do not ever wish to uh, drive in, a, in Chicago again. For one thing, uh, I didn't want to pay the toll. <laughs> and so that meant on my GPS, I said, uh, avoid toll. Well, you know that adds an hour to anywhere you're going because they are a toll place. All right. Well, our scripture today comes from the Gospel of Luke, and uh, I had the great fun of having driven almost 2,000 miles uh, over the last 27 days of just going in and listening to different people as they spoke about scripture. And uh, so I studied a lot while I was driving, and, uh, and, and I just really enjoyed it, and especially what they talked about with Luke and the, uh, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. So I'm going to be sharing a little bit of that with you today. But uh, I wanted uh, to try to get the configuration of the scripture. In chapter 19 of the Gospel, this is when Jesus is moving to Jerusalem. In chapter 9, Jesus set his face to Jerusalem. He's been on the way to Jerusalem the whole time. And you, as the listener, know what happens in Jerusalem. This is not a fun time within the gospel. You know that the crucifixion is coming. You know that Thursday is coming. You know that he's arrested on Thursday night. You know that he's crucified on Friday. You know that stuff. And it just isn't fun to read that. Well, so what we got in chapter 19 is when he actually gets to Jerusalem. Before we get into the scripture and verse 28, what happens just before it is crucial to understanding it. And what happens just before it is this awful parable or allegory that Jesus teaches what he talks about is investing in God's kingdom. But he uses money as the allegory. And we capitalists go, oh, we understand money. We know about investing. And so we pay attention to it. Oh, yeah, this is about investing money. But the allegory is not about money. It's about you. It's about your identity. It's about who you are and what you live in, where you invest yourself. And money is just a symbol for that. And if you don't understand that, you miss the point of the parable. What happens is the man in charge gives money to servants, so 10 servants. And those 10 servants are to operate with that. 
We're supposed to live with that, do what they do with that. When he gets back, he interviews three of them. One of them comes and he says, I invested your money and it came back tenfold. And the master goes, yeah, wow, well done. You will receive the reward. And the next one comes to him and says, master, I invested, uh, I invested and I came back with 50%. Oh my, receive your reward. And the third one comes back and he says, I was scared. I scared of you. I'm scared. I was just scared. So I buried the money. Here it is. Whew. And the master says, take it from me. Give it to the one who has the most. For those who have will receive more. And those who do not will have what they have. But if you understand that that's investing yourself in the kingdom of God, the allegory, then it's a whole different thing, isn't it? If you are scared to put yourself into the kingdom of God, you're scared to give yourself to God, then what comes of that? Nothing. Nothing at all. So now we come to today's scripture. I invite you to stand out of respect and as you are able for the reading of the gospel. Now, uh, by the way, if you're following on the uh, in the insert, uh, it's the third reading, and I'll be finishing with the first reading, which is the end <coughs> of this passage. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethsaida and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you untying it, just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent uh, departed and found it as Jesus had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They said, The Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and throw, after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down the, from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if those that these were silent, the stones would shout out. As he came near and saw the city, Jesus wept over it, saying, If you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes, Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They will crush you to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave within you one stone upon another, because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. A word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. All right. Oh, who doesn't love a great parade? <clears throat> the first day we arrived here was the 3rd of July in 2017. 
And the next day, Julie arranged that we were in the parade on the 4th. And that was fabulous. And we were in it, and you cannot replace us this year. We still get to be in the library parade. We're passing out books uh, pulled by, the cart is pulled by Packer. Packer. Oh, Packer. Oh, what a great time that is. And, uh, but we, we, had, we had competition for passing out books last year. Rita was with us, and so this year she's not going to be, uh, because we, don't, we won't, 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 don't want people taking away our job. You know, I mean, so we're, we're narrowing it down. No, we don't care who's with us. But it was fun. We were in that parade, and I love small town parades. Well, Jesus was in a small town parade, sort of. It was, he was coming to town. He was greeted like a king. He was greeted like a king. Now, in the ancient world, this happens whenever a general, conquering general comes. The whole town is expected to be out and praising the general. Uh, and so that's what happens when the conquering people come in. But this conqueror was not conquered so much. And they are taking their tattered cloaks and throwing them down. That's what you do. Tattered cloaks, if that's who you are. It's the people who've been outsiders that are also a part of this act. But the whole, Luke tells us the whole, the whole town was there. Everybody's there, grieving Jesus. And they're praising God for Jesus, for the powerful act of God that Jesus has done. Now, we today have trouble. I've been trying to think, when do you shout? I mean, you adults, when have you shouted? Well, I've shouted at my kids. I've shouted at other people's kids when I thought they were in danger. You know, I've shouted at them. They didn't listen then, and they don't listen now, but I still shout it. Right? <laughs> When they're in danger, yeah, it's what we do as adults. When do we shout? Well, competitive game, you know, right? Get in there, and if you're a Virginia person, then you shouted probably at your television as uh, Virginia won the, the whatever that last game was. You know? <laughs> you, right? you know, you, maybe you shout, but in a group, certainly we shout in these big games. And if our grandkid is in there playing something, boy, we really shout at them. We want them to know that they are loved. We shout then. When do we shout? When do we shout? When? When he can't hear me. <laughs> yeah, when you're uh, the one nearby that you're trying to communicate with can't hear, you shout more, right? Right? Yeah, that's true. Thank you for being the subject of that. And uh, Jim is, is handling it okay. I don't know what kind of conversation they're going to have later. But okay, when do we shout? When do we shout? Bad drivers in the car alone, we will shout at people, right? right? If you're in a convertible, you're not allowed to stand up and shout at them. You're driving. You've got to stay seated. Okay? Maybe our horn is a shout. TV. Oh, gosh, yeah. Oh, my. I, my way of shouting at the TV is actually turning it off. <laughs> when do we shout? When you're excited. When do you get excited? All the time. All the time. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, that's really a big thing, isn't it? We are, our culture <laughs> is not really into shouting. Our culture is when you get really excited about something, at least the, the Anglo culture, the culture that I'm descended from, we were taught to really hold it all in. <sighs> right? Whether it's good or bad, just hold it in. But this isn't that kind of a group in our scripture today. They're not about holding it all in. They're about letting it all go. And they are excited. What are they excited for? They are excited because the one who is the Messiah has arrived. Now, what is the Messiah going to do? The Messiah is going to kick out the Romans. We have got our swords ready. We are going to join them, and we're going to kick out the Romans, and they are excited. He's coming to town. We're going to be with them. The Romans, the oppressors. Have you ever been oppressed? That is incredible. You're going to kick out the Romans. You're going to kill them. You're going to get rid of them. And it's a whole
whole city of Jerusalem rises behind the Messiah, the Romans don't have a chance. Even though they're fortified, they just can't kill the dog. They can't do it. So Jesus is riding the dog, and the crowds are excited. Do you know I was also listening to this conversation about dopamine? And dopamine has to do with anticipation of pleasure. Dopamine has, it's about the anticipation of pleasure that your, your neuro center is flooded with dopamine. That's the high. It's not the pleasure. That's not when dopamine strikes you. Dopamine hits you when you are anticipating the pleasure. Now, isn't that interesting? But if you think about it, it's probably true in your life. You're going on a, well, how about a 27-day trip? <laughs> and you're going to be going places. You're getting out of breakup. Oh, my. I don't mean breakup. I mean breakup. <laughs> got to be careful, you know, that kind of language. If you're leaving for 27 days, maybe it is a breakup, you know? You know? But, but breakup. You're, and I missed it. Oh, thank you. Of course, I did go to Nebraska, and they were in their own version of breakup. The mud was amazing. But anyhow, anticipation. Oh, I was excited. I love packing for going. But I really get the dopamine when I'm planning the trip. Ask Christina. She'll say yeah. She's not excited. This is not when she gets hit by it. When I'm planning a trip, even if she's included, she's not excited. You know, Christina just doesn't stay. But I've got places I want to go. And if she wants to come, she can. I love getting ready. And that is the anticipation. You may have something. Anticipation of that chocolate brownie that's over there. You know? Anticipation of... You, you fill it in. And that's when it hits. And that's what happens, I would suggest, in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. People are excited. It's like an adrenaline rush. What happens when your anticipation is not met? What do you do? You go to depression? Possibly. What about anger? The very same crowd on Thursday, Thursday night, is going to be yelling, crucify him. Because what does he do? Nothing. Nothing. He got arrested. How can the Messiah get arrested? Huh? Obviously, he's not the Messiah. He didn't get arrested. I mean, the Messiah doesn't get arrested. The Messiah is, God is going to protect. There's a scripture about the angels who will protect the Messiah from even stubbing his toe. He's arrested. Then he's on trial. And he obviously is not the Messiah. Folks, the kingdom of God is not what we think it is. you think it is. It isn't. You can't encompass the kingdom of God in your mind. You can't come close to understanding the mystery of God. We get hints, and we get hints through the parables. Jesus tells us again and again what the kingdom of God is like, but he does it in parables. He doesn't do it in equations. And churches that want to turn religion into equations, this plus this equals this, are denying the mystery of God. They're only opening a little bit of the God story because it's bigger than our imagination. It's called mystery. Another name for God is mystery with a capital M. And the kingdom of God is mystery. And every time we decide what it looks like and who's in it and all that stuff, <laughs> we have gone astray. 
because we don't know. And we won't know until we know. Yeah? Okay? Well, they thought they knew the kingdom of David, and that was the kicking out of the Romans. So what happened? By the time Luke is written, these words are powerful words. Come 30 years after Jesus is crucified, there is an insurrection that was successful in Rome. Somebody led it, and Jerusalem kicked out the oppressors. And what happened? Well, you see it in the scripture that I read to you, what happened. I'll read it again. Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They will crush you to the ground and you and your children within you and they will not leave within you one stone upon another. The Romans came with their army and fortress Jerusalem was cast down. The insurrection failed because they did not understand that Jesus' way was not zealotry, but it was love, respect, giving oneself our Isaiah passage that BJ led us in, turning both cheeks into the attack. In our passage, Jesus says, the stones will shout out. What do those stones say when they used to be stones of the But they are not in the temple anymore. They've been cast out. They've been broken down by the Romans. And they still can speak of God's great love. Hosanna. I thought about, as I was thinking about this sermon, having us see how loud we could get in Hosanna. And I just decided that I can't do it. I just can't have shouting like that. I just can't go for it. Now, if you were youth, maybe I could put up with it, but, uh, you know, we would be struggling to shout Hosanna. Hosanna! Okay, one of us can do it. But I don't know. But have outside voice, child. Don't use your outside voice indoors. Come on. Or, um, I forget, Skip. What do we say? We say, uh, it's not zip, zero. Zero. That's what I've been taught at the Willow School. Is uh, zero level. One, I guess, is whisper. I don't know what shouting is, right? But you get, you get, you know, it'd be hard. What would it mean for you, Stone, to be shouting Hosanna? What would it mean for you when you leave here that you be shouting Hosanna? I am, of everywhere I go. It's not so much you have to raise your voice to praise God for where you are, right? It's also finding that, I don't know what, I don't, I don't think it has to do with pleasure centers, I don't think it's about dopamine, I don't, you know, anticipation is great, but somehow praising God has got to be different. It's, I don't know, I'm, I'm really, this is where I got kind of lost. But I do know that even when we are so disappointed that we start shouting at God, that the God who is on the cross still looks upon us and says, forgive them, for they know not 
give to me, for he does not know what he does. Isn't that right? That's the God that Jesus revealed. That's an incredible God. So we shout, we become stones, we blow it, we yell, crucify him. And still, that God forgives us. Because that's who God is. It is good to be here. It's so good to be in your midst. This week, I hope you will come Thursday night and be a part of that service. Because we'll be talking more about this, but we'll also be enacting that liturgy a little bit in a very significant way. And I think you'd be a good part of your story of, of shouting 